thank you to Pastor Hadley and the worship team for leading us in those songs. I don't know about you, but I have never really liked the week after Christmas. It is a weird week. Some people, myself included, often wrestle with an annual bout of a type of post-Christmas malaise. All the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season, all the excitement and joy of Christmas Day are suddenly over. And we're left with cold weather and the long nights of winter. I honestly think the only real saving grace about this week after Christmas is the preponderance of college football bowl games. Most weeks out of the year, I would not care about the Pop-Tart Bowl. But this week, I'll care about the Pop-Tart Bowl. Today, particularly, is often a unique, interesting day. December 31st, the last day of the year. It's a day that many of us typically use to take stock of the past year. Many of us will consider how 2023 has gone with all its successes and failures. And then many of us will take an honest assessment of our present condition, particularly noting the areas of our lives that we are especially dissatisfied with. And then if discouragement hasn't completely overwhelmed us, we will make resolutions to do better in 2024. Some of us will even craft detailed plans so as to address these deficiencies in the weeks and months that lie ahead. We will strategize. We will scheme. We will even make various purchases to help us accomplish these goals and attain these resolutions. Some of you might resolve to take better care of your health in the coming year. You'll commit to eating less fast food, perhaps joining a gym, even downloading a fitness app or two to your phone. You might even go full crunchy and get into essential oils. Who knows? Some of you might resolve to read more books in the coming year. You'll follow a book reading plan, maybe even join a book club. You'll resolve to expand your literary horizons and stretch your mental faculties by exposing yourself to authors and genres you haven't yet experienced. Some of you might resolve to spend more time with family and loved ones in the coming year. You'll realize, painedly, that you've devoted way too much time to your job, to your career, or even to your hobbies in this past year. Tragically, to the neglect of your spouse, your children, and your friends. And you'll seek to make amends while you still have time and opportunity to do so. Conversely, on the other hand, some of you might consider this coming year as the golden opportunity to jumpstart your career or get ahead in the next phase of your personal professional development. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll resolve that this is the year you finish your college degree or pursue a master's degree or begin a doctorate program. You'll take those continuing education classes in your profession that will garner you yet another certification, perhaps another raise, another promotion, more prestige in the workplace. Whether it be bettering your health, bettering your mind, improving your relationships, jump-starting your career, these resolutions are not necessarily wrong in and of themselves. There is indeed a way to cultivate all these areas of your life in a manner that demonstrates biblical stewardship and that glorifies the Lord who has given you these good gifts and opportunities. But I don't want to talk to you today about these particular resolutions. The condition of your health is important. The condition of your mental faculties is important. The condition of your personal relationships is important. The condition of your workplace performance is important. But none of these, none of these are as important as the condition of your soul. None of these are as important as the condition of your soul. This week, next week, and the week after, we're going to embark on a three-week study called Get After It, God's provision for your growth. Get after it, God's provision for your growth. As we stand here on the last day of 2023, let me ask you, what will you do with your soul in 2024? If you knew that this coming year was the last year of your life, and for some of you, it very well may be, 
What would you do with your soul in 2024? If you knew that you weren't guaranteed to see 2025, and newsflash, none of us are guaranteed to see 2025, what would you focus on in the months ahead? Now, to help you answer this question, I want to pose to you another question. What do you mean when you say that you are saved? Before we get any further, the title for today's message is the Bible's role in the believer's growth. The Bible's role in believer's growth. We're going to be all over the scripture this morning. We talked about New Year's resolutions. I want you to consider what you will do with your soul in 2024. But to answer that question, friend, let me remind you, here's our second question. What do you mean when you say that you are saved? Now, these two questions might seem disjointed and disconnected, but I promise you, To answer the first, you must answer the second. To answer the first, you must answer the second. For those of you who are Christians this morning, who have heard the call of the true gospel and have done what the Lord has called of you, in Luke 9, 23, in Luke 14, and in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark 8, 34, you've denied yourself, taken up your cross daily, and have followed Christ. What do you mean when you call yourself a saved man or a saved woman? What does it mean that you are saved? I am convinced that if you understand the doctrine of salvation in the way that the scripture portrays it, you will be able to answer the question of what should you do with your soul in 2024. So let me ask you again, what do you mean when you say that you are saved? Many people understand salvation mean that you have escaped eternal conscious torment writhing under the righteous and holy wrath of God, an eternity spent in hell, in flames, chains, tears, and agony. And that's true. That is true. Jesus himself said in John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed, has passed from death to life. So yes, being saved does mean that you have escaped by God's grace, the wrath that is to come. And now your eternal destiny is safe and secure in the hand of God. But there's more to it. If we were to press the issue further, what does it mean that you're saved? Some here might state that it means you have a change of allegiances, a change of families, a change of masters. And this is also true. For those of us who are genuinely born-again Christians, because of God's saving work in our life, We read in Colossians 1.13 that he, God the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You have been given a new allegiance. You've been moved from the kingdom of the evil one to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. You belong to him. (coughs) Excuse me. But let's press the issue even further. We understand that being saved means we've escaped righteous wrath. We've been transferred in our citizenship to the kingdom of Christ, but there's more to it. The Bible points out, and some would say this, that being saved means now we walk in newness of life. We must, of necessity, practice a new way of living, and this is also true. We are not saved by our works. We are only saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ, applied to our account by the mercy of God. But once we are saved, we will walk in good works. We will walk in newness of life, which will be demonstrated by a transformed manner of living. As truly born again children of God, those who are genuinely saved will practice good deeds as a fruit of salvation. Titus 2, 13 through 14, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Ephesians 2, 10 sums this up beautifully. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should, that which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this is also another aspect of salvation. You now do good deeds. You walk in obedience. You demonstrate the fruit of a transformed life. All of these are aspects of salvation. But I want you to understand today that it goes even deeper than these. More than escaping hell, more than having your allegiance transferred from Satan to Christ, More than now having the ability to walk in good deeds, fundamentally being saved means that you are a restored image bearer. You are a restored image bearer. 
You were saved. Friend, get this. You were saved ultimately to bring glory to God by increasingly reflecting the character of Jesus Christ. You were saved ultimately to bring glory to God by increasingly reflecting the character of Jesus Christ. All of us, from the oldest person in this room to the baby that was just born this morning, from Adam and Eve all the way down to us present and alive today in 2023, on the cusp of 2024, all human beings have been made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 through 27, then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Hebrew word for bearing God's image is a specific term that means you are someone who reflects the glory of one greater than you. Just as the moon does not have light in and of itself, but reflects the beautiful light of the sun, so you, as an image bearer, are called to to reflect the glory of one greater than you. That's what Adam and Eve were called to do as they stewarded God's creation, as they engaged in taking care of the animals and taking care of the plants and taking care of the garden that God had given to them. They were to do it in a way that demonstrated God's character and demonstrated to a watching world, including all of physical creation and the spiritual world, that God's way is best. That's what it means to be an image bearer. As you go about your job, whether you are a CEO, an MD, a stay-at-home mom, whatever, whatever God has called you to do, your calling, your occupation is noble because you are an image bearer. You reflect God's character. But the sad fact is, apart from Christ, you can't do that. Because of the fall, our ability to be God-glorifying image bearers has been horribly marred and twisted. Instead of choosing to walk in God's ways and thus demonstrate that God is glorious and his way is best, in our sinful condition, we choose to walk in selfishness and wickedness and thereby defy and dishonor God from our births. Every time you cut corners at work, every time you're disrespectful to your boss, every time you're rude to your spouse, every time you're harsh with your kids, you're not being an image bearer. You're doing the opposite. You're saying God's way isn't worth it, my way is better. Genesis 8, 21, God says the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Ecclesiastes seven twenty, Solomon laments, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Romans 3, 10 through 12, Paul stitches together several Old Testament texts to demonstrate the absolute corruption all of us begin life with as marred image bearers. He says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Because of inherent sin in our lives, we are unable, unable to reflect the image of God as we were designed to do. The image of God is still there, but it's horribly marred by sin. And friends, if God had not acted on our behalf, if there was no gospel, then there would be no way for us to reflect the image of God and fulfill the purpose for which we were created. We would be useless, pointless, and on our way irrevocably towards damnation. But God, in his kindness, did indeed send his perfect son, Jesus Christ, to be one of us, fully God and fully man, our substitute, the one who fulfilled the righteous law of God on our behalf. But not only that, he went to the cross and yielded up his life, taking on the curse of God because the Old Testament says, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. He took on the curse of God in your place and in my place, yielded up himself, died, and rose again victorious so that you could have newness of life, so that you could be changed and transformed, so that you could be forgiven and cleansed and made new. And now, now, because of Christ, you can be an image bearer. See, this is the point of salvation. This brings us back to our New Year's resolution. Why were you saved? Romans eight twenty nine. jot it down. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. It is as we grow, 
in our reflection of the character of Jesus Christ, who is himself the perfect image of God, as Colossians 1.15 describes, we bring more and more glory to God. How do you get back to being an image bearer that glorifies God? You look more like Christ. How do you look more like Christ? Great question. You grow. What should you focus on in 2024? Looking like Christ. Growing in Christ likeness. When we talk about this series that we're doing today, next week, and the week after, spiritual growth, it's not aimless growth. It's not choose your own adventure growth. There is a design specific end. The end is that you would look less like you and more like Jesus. You say, less like me? Yeah, less like you. We live in a culture that worships individuality and personality. That's just my personality, that's just who I am. You know, most of who you are is sinful. Me too. Look less like you, look more like Jesus. But that means there'll be less of me. Good. John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. If that's not appealing to you, you need to ask if you're saved. Because to be saved means Jesus takes first place. Jesus takes first place. It is a joy for the Christian to look less like their old, unconverted self and more like Christ every day. Don't buy into personality tests. Well, I'm this personality, I'm that personality. No, you're not. Pitch that out the window. You're either lost in your sins or you're someone who's called to be conformed increasingly to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what you were saved for, to finally be able to fulfill your created purpose, to be an image bearer of God, following in the footsteps of the perfect image bearer, Jesus Christ, the most holy man who ever lived. To grow in Christ's likeness is to grow in holiness. To grow in holiness is to grow in sanctification. Those three terms are synonymous with one another. Christ's likeness, holiness, and sanctification. This is what you're called to focus on in 2024, above all other pursuits. Forget dieting. Forget reading a book a week. Forget your career. If you do not make this your priority for 2024, to grow in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are categorically wasting your life. You're wasting your life. Christian, you are called to grow in Christ-likeness. You are commanded to grow in Christ-likeness. You must grow in Christ-likeness. You say, I'm commanded? Absolutely you are. This is how the Apostle Peter finishes his second and final letter, the last piece of inspired scripture that he would write before his execution by crucifixion at the hands of the tyrannical persecution of the madman Nero. Peter writes to his dear sheep, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. For you grammar nerds, grow there is a present active imperative. You, right now, do this thing right now with no specific ending. Keep doing it until you die. Present active imperative. Grow, 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 grow. What does grow mean? The Greek word is oxano. It means to increase. It specifically, Strong's points out, refers to inward Christian growth. The same word shows up in 2 Corinthians 10, 15. Paul writes to the Corinthians, our hope is that as your faith increases, oxano, as your faith, your trust, your confidence grows. Colossians 1:10. Paul writes to the Colossians, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing, again, oxano, growing in the knowledge, intimate knowledge, not just head knowledge, but personal knowledge of God. From these passages, 2 Peter 3, 18, 2 Corinthians 10, 15, and Colossians 1, 10, we understand that we as Christians are commanded to increase in reflecting God's grace in our lives, to increase our trust, faith in God, and to increase our personal knowledge of God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. That's what, what it means to grow. That's what it means to grow. How? How do we do this? How exactly are we to grow in Christ's likeness? Well, God has given us three primary means of growing in Christ-likeness. We'll we'll look at those this week, next week, and the week after. Today, we'll look at his word, the Bible, which he has given us as pure spiritual spiritual milk, 1 Peter 2.2. Like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word that by it you may grow into salvation. Second, God has given the permission and ability to speak to him in prayer to help us grow in Christ-likeness. Prayer accomplishes multiple things. But one of the things it does accomplish is our spiritual growth. 
Third, God has, God has given us his body, the local church, to help us grow in Christ's likeness. That's what Ephesians 4 is all about. A lone wolf Christian is a sickly, dying, or potentially false Christian. You need the local church. The Bible, prayer, and the local church. Often when someone comes into my office struggling with a besetting sin, if they're frustrated with their lack of spiritual growth, if they're wrestling with fear, anxiety, or even lack of assurance of salvation, often it is because they have neglected one or usually all three because these things tend to go together. Usually all three of these means of spiritual growth in Christ. You can be a genuine believer, but be sick in your soul if you have neglected these means of grace. If you, a living human being, neglect a balanced diet, if you only eat Pop-Tarts or Mountain Dew or peanut butter M&Ms, and yes, I just described most of my diet in college, you will not have good health. You will not be running marathons. If you neglect the word, if you neglect prayer, if you neglect the local church, you will be a sick sheep. God has done so much for us in our salvation. Before we move on to talking about the scripture, just briefly, I want to talk to you about your salvation. In fact, most of what we call salvation is all the work of God. It is monergistic, a term that means God alone is the actor. Salvation includes the following actions. These are just ones I came up off the top of my head while studying Scripture. There's probably more, but these are the ones I could come up with. First, foreknowledge. God knew us before the foundation of the world. We, in, his, in his mind, he was aware of us, not of what we would pick on our own plan, but according to his plan, his counsels. He predestined us. He set everything in motion. Election, he chose us Fourth, at the right moment in time in history, in 33 AD, Jesus Christ yielded up his life as an atonement and propitiation. Foreknowledge, predestination, election, atonement, propitiation. Fifth, at the right moment in your life, at a certain time and place in history, just as Jesus called to Lazarus from the tomb, Lazarus come forth, God called to you in the act of regeneration. There was a moment you were dead, and then there was a moment where God said, live, and you lived. Simultaneous with regeneration is justification. Regeneration is a spiritual corpse being made alive. Justification is a guilty man being declared innocent because the righteousness of another has been applied to your account. Regeneration deals with life. Justification deals with guiltlessness. With that is conversion, being moved from one camp to another camp. Being moved from the enemy's team to the Savior's kingdom. Regeneration, justification, conversion would have been more than enough. Would have been more than enough. All of those are the necessary outworkings of God's salvation. But there's another aspect of salvation that people have called the crown jewel of salvation. That was not necessary. But God, because he is a gracious God and a kind God and a loving God, lavished on us this next aspect of our salvation, adoption. Adoption. God didn't need to adopt you. Christ died for your sins. You could go free. And just like the prodigal son who came home, you could live as a hired hand. That's what he thought sitting there in the pig pen. I'll go back living as a hired hand. But what did his dad do? Luke 15. He runs to him, embraces him, puts the robe on him, the ring on him, kills the fatted calf. That's adoption. You were an orphan and God took you in and made you a full heir. Adoption. Simultaneous with conversion, regeneration, justification, adoption is positional sanctification. You are placed in Christ. You were, before your conversion, a filthy, wicked, wretched sinner. But now you are in Christ, covered by Christ as your head, as your leader. So when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ approximately 24 times in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul uses a prepositional phrase, in Christ, through Christ, in him, through him. That's referring to positional sanctification. In Christ is where you live now and forever because at the same time, 10, you were at the moment of your salvation sealed by the Spirit. You're preserved all the way to the end. Your eternal security is absolutely guaranteed you will not, you cannot, I repeat, you cannot lose your salvation if you are genuinely saved. And if somebody comes along and says that that is a false teaching, they're not reading their Bible. 
They're not reading John 10 or Romans 8. If you are genuinely saved, you will persevere to the end because God has sealed you and secured you by his Holy Spirit. 11, which is our focus for this series, is progressive sanctification. We'll talk about that in a moment. 12, looking ahead, is resurrection. You will either die and be the first raised when God calls for his church to come join him in heaven, or assuming you live until the rapture, you will be called up into heaven. But your resurrection is absolutely guaranteed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, John 14, Jesus is coming back for you. Whether you're alive or dead, you will be resurrected. 13, glorification. When you get to heaven, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you'll be transformed and changed. This old tent that breaks down, starts breaking down at the age of 25, and from what I'm seeing, it just speeds up like an avalanche, is going to be made new. You'll be glorified with a body like Jesus's. There's 13 aspects here, probably more if we sat down and thought, thought of them, but only one of these is not monergistic. Just take a moment. Twelve of these are purely, completely monergistic. God does everything. He has done it all. He has accomplished it all. The error of the Roman Catholic Church and so many other false religions is thinking that you have to do certain things or jump through various hoops to accomplish these aspects of salvation or to maintain these aspects of salvation. That's a damnable lie. It is a lie to say that we add to these things. There's only one on this list, number 11, that we play any part in. And just as much as it is an error to say that we play an active role in any of the others, foreknowledge, predestination, election, atonement, propitiation, regeneration, justification, conversion, so on and so forth, just as much as an error to say we play a role in those, it is also an equally heinous error to minimize our responsibility to grow in Christ's likeness. There was a false theology from the mid-1800s It was a pernicious theology infiltrating England called Keswick theology. You ever see it spelled out? It's Keswick, but it's pronounced Keswick. Keswick theology. Basically, the idea of, uh, if you had to sum it up real briefly, it was let go and let God. Just think about the truths of the Bible, and you will be made more like Christ. It denies, it denies the incumbent necessity laid upon you to grow in Christ's likeness. That theology has reared its head time and again throughout the decades. Most recently, uh, an author named Tullian Chavidjian about 10 years ago wrote a book called Jesus Plus Nothing Equals Everything, in which basically he neutered the second half of most of the Pauline epistles, saying all you have to do is just focus on the gospel and you'll grow in Christ's likeness, completely minimizing and sadly negating all of the commands to mortify sin, to cultivate holiness, to walk in righteousness, to grow in Christ's likeness. Consequently, that man advocating that false theology disqualified himself from ministry, falling into terrible sin, because that's where that type of thinking always leads to. It leads to licentiousness. Friends, you're called to grow. You're commanded to grow. That's progressive sanctification. God works in you, Philippians 2, as you work as well. God works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And at the same time, you are called to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Hit the spiritual gym. Hit the spiritual gym, which brings us to our topic for this morning. In the time that we have left, what has God given you to help you grow? First and foremost, he's given you the Bible. He's given you the Bible. This book that you may have multiple copies of, this book that might sit unread between Sunday and Wednesday, Wednesday and Sunday, God has graciously given you this book so that you would, by it, grow into salvation. 1 Peter 2, 2. Like a newborn babe who longs for the pure spiritual milk of the word, you should crave after the word of God so that you can grow more and more in Christ-likeness. Help us understand the Bible. Let's ask and answer some questions. First and foremost, let's ask, what does the Bible say about itself? Because the Bible makes claims about itself that no other book in all of creation makes claims of. What does the Bible say about itself? I want you to understand this in no unmistaken terms. The Bible claims to be inspired. 
It is the very word of God. The Bible claims to be inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Literally, Paul says this word comes forth directly from God. It is theopneustos, God breathed. It emanates from God. Yes, God used approximately 40 different men over a period of time of almost 2,000 years, beginning with the book of Job and ending with the book of Revelation. He used different authors, human authors, with different educational backgrounds, different lifestyles, uh, different, different experiences. Some were Poets, some were kings, some were herdsmen, some were farmers, some were scholars. And God used all of them to speak his truth. That's why Peter sounds different than John, and John sounds different than Paul, and Paul sounds different than Isaiah. But all of them contain a unified message. Because, as 2 Peter 1.21 says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That Greek term is the same idea of wind filling the sails of a sailing ship. Men carried along by the Holy Spirit. The ultimate author of all scripture is God. Don't move past this too quickly. That book you hold comes from God. God has spoken to you. He has spoken to you in these 66 books you hold right here. Do you read it? The Bible claims that it is inspired. It is the very word of God. Because it's the very word of God, then, by consequence, it is inerrant. Secondly, the Bible claims that it is inerrant. It possesses absolutely no errors whatsoever. Hebrews 6.18 reminds us that it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, if this comes from God, then there are no errors. Errors, And I don't care what your college professor says. I don't care what your neighbor who's gone to graduate school after graduate school says. I don't care what you hear on the History Channel. There are no errors in the Scripture, period. In the original manuscripts, the Bible is inerrant. People have been trying for thousands of years to do gotcha moments on the Scripture, to find areas where manuscripts don't match up. There is no controversy, no discrepancy that cannot be resolved by honest, simple textual criticism. We have, by God's grace, thousands of copies of manuscripts, either partial or full, of the Old and New Testament. And by honest, intellectual comparison of these manuscripts, we can arrive with 100% confidence of what the Word of God says. We know, even though we don't have the original manuscripts, we know with confidence what the word of God says. It is inerrant. Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word proves true. The Bible claims to be inspired and claims to be inerrant and in claims, therefore, to be infallible. It has unfailing certainty. You can, therefore, apply it and trust your life with it. You can trust it with your life. Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, 19, he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. More fully confirmed than what? Well, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, earlier in the chapter, just a few verses ahead, he's writing about his personal experience on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Jesus Christ transfigured in his glory. Peter says, I saw Christ with my own eyes transfigured in his glory. But you know what? Don't listen to me. What's more confident than the eyewitness testimony of an apostle, Jesus Christ's right-hand man? What's more confident than that? Peter tells us himself, the prophetic word more fully confirmed. The written scriptures. The written scriptures are even more trustworthy than the verbal eyewitness testimony of one of Christ's apostles. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Peter says, 119, 2 Peter 119, to which you will do well to pay attention. Give it your full focus. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This is what the Bible claims about itself. It is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible. And this is absolutely true. Men and women have tried for thousands of years to disprove it and none have succeeded. 
Those of you who are saved, you know this instinctively. That's one of the fruits of salvation, is that when you sit down and you read the word of God, you know that it tells you just by reading it, that in this are the words of life. And if you're not a believer this morning, you sit outside saying, well, that's secular, that, sorry, that's circular reasoning. That's circular reasoning. That's specious reasoning. That doesn't make sense. You use the Bible to prove the Bible. If it is the word of God, then there's no higher authority. It is self-attesting. It is self-attesting. And this is demonstrably true in the life of anybody who's been born again. It is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. You can trust it. You must trust it. Why? Because it can do so much for you. It can do so much for you. We've seen what the Bible claims about itself. What does the Bible say it can do for you? What does the Bible claim it can do for you? Sitting down, trying to jot down what the Bible claims it can do for you, I came up with at least 10 things. There's probably more. Let's just look at these. And again, I want to relieve you. I will email you my notes. I'll send you my PowerPoint. You don't, don't feel like you have to get all these down. Don't be a Catholic note taker. If I don't get them all, I'm in trouble. No, just, just write down what's helpful. Write down what's helpful. There's no test. It's just the test is life, okay? Just write down what's helpful. What does the Bible say it can do for you? One, the Bible reveals to you the way of salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15. Paul writes to T Timothy, from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You've read Pilgrim's Progress? If you haven't, you need to. You need to read your Bible and then you need to read Pilgrim's Progress. You can throw away all your other books. If you have just those two books, you'll be just fine. Christian along his journey meets all sorts of people. Hypocrisy, formalism, Mr. Worldly Wiseman, obstinate, pliable, everybody saying, come this way, come this way, come this way, come this way, come this way. He holds to the book. He holds to the book. It is able to make you wise unto salvation. Second, the Bible displays to you the depth of your sin. Romans 7, 7 through 12. Paul writes in Romans 7, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. The Bible shows us a mirror, and it's sometimes painful to look at. Hebrews 4, 12. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, divides us all the way to the vision of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It cuts deep. It cuts deep. It shows us our sin. Third, the Bible demonstrates to you the full glory of God. This is all of Scripture. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, the Bible puts God on display in a way that you cannot get by looking at creation alone. Yes, Romans 1, Psalm 19, creation does tell us aspects of God's glory, that he's wise, that he's beautiful, that he's, that he's intelligent, that he's kind. He sends the rain on the righteous and the wicked. But it doesn't tell us everything about the glory of God, everything we need to know about God's glory. And there's more that hasn't been revealed to us, Romans 11, 33 through 36. So the depth and wisdom and knowledge of God, it's unsearchable, it's unfathomable. We'll spend all of eternity exploring it and we'll never get to the bottom. But all that you need to know is in the pages of Scripture. Fourth, the Bible explains to you your need for a Savior. Galatians 4, 21 through 26. Galatians 4, 23, before faith came, we were held captive under the law in prison until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. Fifth, the Bible proclaims to you the beauty of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul sets up a contrast. The unbelieving Jews, when they look at the Scripture, Paul says, there's a veil. They can't see the beauty of the Messiah. But for those who are born again, both Jew and Gentile, who are born again, that veil's removed. And they see Christ as truly beautiful. If you're a Christian, the Bible proclaims to you the beauty of Jesus Christ. Six, the Bible is the instrument by which God brings about regeneration. Regeneration, salvation, atonement was accomplished at the cross and the empty tomb. The righteous life of Christ, the substitutionary death of Christ, and the victorious resurrection of Christ secured your salvation. But the moment of regeneration, God says, is brought about through the ministry of the word. 1 Peter 1.23, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. James 1.18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Isaiah 55, God sends forth his word and it accomplishes the purpose for which he sends it. Why do you think we preach the Bible so much? I can't save you. Bart can't save you. None of your pastors or elders or shepherds can save you. God saves people through the ministry of the word of God. As Ezekiel the prophet prophesied the word, not his own words, because he would be a false prophet if he did that, but he prophesied the word of God to the valley of the dry bones. What happened? God sent forth life. That's why we preach the word. Seven, 
The Bible teaches you how to avoid sin and instead walk in obedience. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Eight, the Bible instructs you in what is wise and what is foolish. Proverbs 6.23, the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Nine, the Bible informs you in deep theological truth that you would otherwise be ignorant of. Psalm 119.18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. You would know nothing about the eternal counsels of God. Nothing about angels, nothing about demons, nothing about the evil one, nothing about spiritual warfare, nothing about God's future plans, nothing about eschatology, nothing about the beauty of Christ in the local church. If God had not revealed it to you in the pages of Scripture, 10, the Bible crafts for you a comprehensive worldview. How do you understand this world around you that God made? You read God's book. You can have PhD after PhD. You could be educated. You could study abroad. But if you are not looking at this world around you through God's book, you're a fool. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. You're a fool if you're not looking at God's world, God's way, through God's word. 2 Corinthians 10.45 teaches us that our weapons of warfare, as we know, Paul talks about that, it's the sword of the spirit. They're not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We tear down false worldviews and, in, in contrast, construct our real worldview according to the word of God. That's what the Bible can do for you. And yet, sadly, you let it sit unread. You let it sit unread read. The Bible is inspired. The Bible is inerrant. The Bible is infallible. The Bible can transform you. What kind of transformation does the Bible bring? Psalm 19, 7 through 11. We don't have time to walk through the whole passage. Let me just read to you these verses. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and are righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, by the scriptures, is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Friends, the Bible changes the lost sinners in, in ways that nothing else in all creation can. It gives life to the sinner. It gives wisdom to the immature. It gives joy to the heart. It gives understanding to the soul. It gives the sinner the proper reverence, the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. It gives the believer confidence in the unchanging character of God. That's verse 9b. It says, the rules of the Lord are true. Literally, it should be the rulings. The decisions of the Lord are trustworthy. In a world full of uncertainty and fake news and things you don't know if you can trust, trust God's word. It gives you certainty and a sure foundation. The Bible gives the believer a new sense of what is truly precious in this life. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. You know you're saved when you cherish God's word. When it is precious to you. When you don't let anything get in the way from your reading of God's word. When you prioritize your time in the word because it points you to God. Not because like a Pharisee you're just merely puffing your head. But but you read the word of God so that you can know the God of the word. And your Bible is precious to you for that end. That's when you say with the psalmist, it's sweeter than honey. It's more valuable than gold. It's more valuable than the wealth of this world. It's more enjoyable than any pleasure of this world. Verse 11, the Bible keeps the believer on the straight and narrow all of their days. It tells us of the dangers and sins that would destroy us. We are warned accordingly, and it directs us to the joy that only God can bring. What then must we do with the Bible? If that's what the Bible can do for you, what should you do with the Bible? Friends, you must read the Bible. You must study the Bible. You must memorize and meditate on the Bible. Do you know... How many hours per week you look at your phone? How many hours per day? Do you get that report? Mine always comes to me on Sunday mornings in the middle of church, and I always feel convicted. <laughs> get that notification. You spent X amount of hours this last week per day looking at your phone. What would your Bible say if it gave you the same type of report? If your Bible could give you that same type of report, you spent X amount of hours per day looking at your Bible, what would it say? 0.02? Point five, one hour a day? You must read the Bible, 
You must study the Bible. You must memorize and meditate on the Bible. Frankly, everything up till now has been introduction. What do we mean, read the Bible? What do we mean, read the Bible? I want to give you five ways you should read the Bible. You must read the Bible humbly. You must read the Bible humbly. If you come to the Word of God thinking that you know better than the Word of God, be wary. You're in company with men like Nadab and Abihu. The Bible does not yield its treasures to proud men, one preacher has said. It does not yield its treasures to proud men. It does not yield its treasures to lazy men. You do not sit in judgment over the Scripture. The Scripture sits in judgment over you. You submit to whatever the Scripture says, no matter how painful, no matter how difficult. If you are convicted by a clear reading of Scripture to do something or to emulate something, you do it. You cannot be holding on to unconfessed and undealt with sin as you approach God's holy word. Uzzah was killed for less. This is God's precious word that he's exalted above his name. And some of you will look at horrible images on your computer or your phone, feel convicted, but not really deal with the sin, and then go read your Bible. Be wary. You must submit to learning God's truth God's way recognizing that his truth does not yield itself to proud people or to lazy people. You should read the Bible humbly. You should read the Bible every day. You should read the Bible every day. Ryle points out the Israelites in the wilderness could not live on yesterday's manna with the exception of the Sabbath day. They had to collect fresh manna for every day. So too should be your reading of the scripture. Don't live on yesterday's devotions. Don't live on yesterday's devotions because the evil one doesn't take a day off. He doesn't take a day off. He is barraging you, whether you recognize it or not. He's the accuser, the slanderer, the tempter. Fill your mind with the sword of the Spirit. Read the Bible every day. Don't live on yesterday's manna. You should be strategic about the time and place in which you read the Bible. It's called a, it's called a quiet time for a reason. Try to find a place and time in which distractions are limited and minimal. Give God the best of your focus. My college pastor said that his disciple told him over and over and over again, it's better to live on it than sleep on it. Now, if your only choice is do your devotions in the evening before bed or not at all, then do your devotions in the evening. But if you have the option to do them in the morning versus do them in the evening, as a pastor, let me just tell you, do them in the morning. It's better to live on it than to sleep on it. Have a notepad with you. When intrusive thoughts and distractions or tasks, oh, I got to get this at the grocery store or I need to say this to this friend, just jot it down on an open note on your phone or notepad next to you so you can get your attention straight, right back to the word. The evil one is right there looking to distract you and to pull you away from studying the scripture. Fourth, you should love your physical Bible. Apps are great. I love the ESV app. But apps are no substitute to an actual physical Bible. Remember my college pastor saying, you want to have the copy of God's word that you want with you on your deathbed. You should know your Bible. The pages should feel familiar to you. You should know where all the books are located. Be able to turn to this precious passage or that precious passage. One of my Bible professors said, have a cool Bible. And he, he gives this advice he gave to us in college. Have a cool Bible, a layout and font size that you enjoy, a Bible that you love to read. Your Bible should be your most precious possession. Read the entire Bible. Don't just pick and choose. Devotionals are not sufficient in and of themselves. Devotionals are great. Morning and Evening by Spurgeon is one of the best devotions out there. Daily Readings from the Life of Christ by Ryle is excellent. New Morning Mercies by Paul Tripp is pretty good. But devotions by themselves are not sufficient. You need all of the scripture. You need the genealogies. You need the tribal allotments in Joshua and Chronicles. You need all of it because it was all given to you for your growth. If you have questions on how that works, please talk to one of your pastors. You must read the Bible. Next, you must study the Bible. Study the Bible. When I say read, I'm talking about reading broadly. When I say study, I'm talking about reading deeply. You need to be both deep and wide. You need to be both deep and wide. Reading broadly, studying deeply. Paul says, 1 Timothy 4, 13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. This is a big picture of Bible study. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Public reading of Scripture is the idea of observation. Studying the Bible. Observation. You must read the Scripture. Then, to teaching is interpretation. And finally, to exhortation. That's application. You must ask, what do I see in the passage? You must ask, what does this mean? And you must ask, what do I do? Three steps of Bible study. After the big picture of Bible study, 1 Timothy 4.13, the three steps of Bible study are observation. Ask, what does the text say? 
Second interpretation, what does it mean? Let me give you five quick principles of interpretation. The literal principle, take scripture at face value. Take scripture at face value. Literal does not mean wooden. It allows for figures of speech. But the clear, simple reading of the text is the best reading of the text. Literal principle. Second, historical principle. Historical principle. Understand the background of the book. Be Sherlock Holmes. Why was Philippians written to the Philippians? Why was Galatians written to the Galatians? That's a historical principle. Grammatical principle. Understand the language of the text. Don't be afraid of Greek and Hebrew. Blueletterbible.org is a fascinating, helpful, helpful resource. It's basically Logos for free. It parses and breaks down every Greek and Hebrew word. There's theology in prepositions. There's theology in participles. There's theology in verbs. Get into the actual text. Fourth, the contextual principle. Don't just look at your own passage. Look at the passages that become before and after. You know, the passage on church discipline is surrounded by the passage on forgiving your neighbor 70 times 7 and the passage on the good shepherd seeking after the hundredth sheep. Doesn't the context impact our understanding of what God means in the practice of church discipline? Literal, historical, grammatical, contextual. Fifth and finally, the connection synthesis principle. All of Scripture is connected. Use cross-references. Get a good Bible with good cross-references. Remember the goal of all biblical interpretation is to arrive at authorial intent. After that, ask what's required of me. James 1.22, be not hearers only deceiving yourselves, but be doers of the word. What helps you in obeying the scripture? Finally, memorizing and meditating on the scripture. The righteous man, the righteous woman, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Is your delight in the law of the Lord? Do you meditate on it day and night? Memorizing scripture is not just for kids on Wednesday nights. It's not just for kids in Awana programs. It's for you, believer. You can memorize scripture. In fact, you must memorize scripture. Have so much scripture in you that if the day ever comes that you are separated from your Bible, if the day ever comes that you are separated from your Bible, it will already be hidden in your heart. You must read, you must study, you must memorize and meditate. My prayer for you is that you would desire the pure milk of the word, that thereby you may grow into salvation. And that would be your resolution for 2024. If you want help with that, there are four different Bible reading plans available on the Resource Center. Uh, There's a chronological Bible reading plan, a simple read through the year. There's the Robert Murray McShane Bible reading plan that looks like this. And then there's another one that I particularly love, the Grant Horner 10 Chapters a Day Bible reading system. I would recommend that one strongly, 10 chapters a day, as an excellent Bible reading plan. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time reading the scripture. Thank you so much for this gift of your word, that it can make us wise into salvation and helps us grow in Christ-likeness. I pray that that would be what we do as a church body this year, that we would not just pay lip service to the scripture, but we would cherish the scripture and grow in the scripture so that ultimately we bring glory to Christ. pray this in your name. Amen.